everybody. Welcome to another session of Facebook Live. I am Patty Dorito, the owner and founder of Holistic Healing Atlanta. At Holistic Healing Atlanta, we incorporate healing the body, where we address nutrition, exercise, sleep, de-stressing, and balancing our genetics through holistic methylation, healing the mind through traditional therapy and quantum neural reset therapy, where we balance the brain and address past traumas that are still affecting us today and neurofeedback. We also address the spiritual, the soul. Each person comes to us as an individual with an individual set of issues and therefore no two protocols will be the same. And I know personally when I address the body, the mind and the soul, I'm a much more balanced, healthy person. So I love getting your emails with feedback and suggestions. If you have any questions during the show, please feel free in the chat box to enter them and we'll get them answered. Or you can contact me later. Um, I sent out a newsletter today and if you would like to receive it, you can contact it, contact me. It's really about in November, it's a time where we can reflect and we can give thanks and, but slowing down and understanding why we do what we do and journaling is a great option to help. So anyway, I gave some suggestions in there. Um, so tonight is about fighting the battle of Alzheimer's disease. So this is a very personal uh, show for me. My mom has Alzheimer's and her mother had it as well. It's been a sad journey to losing my mother in bits and pieces, um, but it also motivates me to help educate people that there are things that we can do to prevent or slow down the progress. According to the Alzheimer's Association, there are almost 6 million people living with Alzheimer's in the US while the numbers keep rising. It's the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. There are things we can do to keep our brain healthy, even if we have the genetic propensity for Alzheimer's. Although we may not have symptoms showing at the moment, it doesn't mean that we aren't headed towards this devastating disease later in life. So tonight I have a very special doctor who specializes in the brain, Dr. Jerome Livick. Dr. Jerome is a twin and he was born in Africa. His family immigrated from Zaire when he was seven uh, to the mountains of Tennessee. The family had $100 in their back pocket. As a youth, he worked in a metalworking foundry with his two brothers and his father every day until his father died and then in restaurants. At the age of 17, Dr. Drone had his first debilitating migraine, which continued for years without any help from traditional medicine. His undergraduate degree is in digital animation and multimedia special effects. Then at the age of 26, he went back to school to get a doctoral degree in chiropractic and board certified in neurology. He decided that he wanted to care for those on the margin who were abandoned, lost, or misunderstood in the healthcare arena, those like him. So Dr. Jerome specializes in the brain, but specifically with childhood development disorders vestibular rehabilitation, movement disorders, neurochemistry, concussions, and brain injury rehabilitation. In the process, he learned that our bodies, minds, and souls are for, far more bent towards recovery than we ever imagined. The experience gave him hope for healing for himself and for others. He tries to connect the dots between the unanswered questions and solutions. In his practice, after seeing patients improve speech, mobility, and brain function, once thought impossible, he knows that we have good reason for hope. Dr. Jerome is the owner and founder of Thrive Neuro Health and Thrive Neuro Theology and Identity in Atlanta, Georgia. So please welcome our guest, Dr. Jerome Livick. Thanks for having me, Patty. It's great well, to see you. Yeah, thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's great to see you. Likewise. So um, anyway, so how did you get interested in the brain? You know, I think the biggest thing is some of the things you shared um, more than anything was I, I went to 21 specialists over nine years to get a diagnosis for a neurological disorder. Um, I have what's called a Chiari type one mal uh, malformation, uh, fancy language for I have some real estate issues and some plumbing issues. 
structurally in, uh, in and around my brainstem or the top of my brainstem. Um, and, you know, uh, being a patient who couldn't really find any clarity, I, the reason I became a doctor was I, I couldn't find one that knew how to work with folks like me or was uh, really finding any results with demographics like me, stuck between traditional care that's really great at triage and damage control and alternative care that's really great at wellness but not really specializing in complex cases or functional rehab in a complex case and going, what if those two things were married uh, within the same kind of real estate? So I fell in love with the philosophy of chiropractic, but the academia and understanding and kind of the clinical side of neurology and, and ended up getting uh, degrees in both of those. Yeah, he's not saying it, but he's really smart. <laughs> That's what my mom says, but we're immigrant kids, so every mom says that if you're an immigrant kid. <laughs> <laughs> so going into like the Alzheimer's stuff, like what actually is happening in the brain that people start with forgetfulness or memory loss? You know, a lot of the times I think one of the things that's often misunderstood in a lot of these spaces is every single person who deals with any degree of fatigue is going to experience symptoms that are similar to dementia or Alzheimer's. You know, you talk about forgetfulness, decision-making, memory, disorientation. You take the healthiest person on the planet and you make them sleep deprived, they will end up demented. So it's one of those things that I think a lot of the times we, we have to take a step back and go, are these things normal for the experience that I've had this month or this year or this decade? Or are they becoming consistent and frequent to the point of concern? Uh, so one of the things that I would kind of share with everybody is kind of a benchmark is you want to look at in intensity, frequency, and duration. How strong is the experience? How often does it happen? How long does it last for? If you have a really intense moment of forgetfulness, but it's also related to three days of really bad sleep, but if a power went out for three days and you have three kids five and under, which was my weekend, <laughs> maybe decision making is understandably biased or skewed. Um, but I think a lot of the times it's things we'll get into over the course of the night, but you may be dehydrated. You may not have enough fuel or nutrition in your body. You may be having a hormonal change based on your cycle if you're female, or you may have some sort of experience that you're having based on your functional medicine, metabolic side if you're male or female. Uh, so a lot of the times it can be attributed to things that are very normal experiences for a human being. We just have to start considering if they become more frequent, do they become a point of concern? Yeah, and that's a good point. I know I've had clients come to me and say, I think I have Alzheimer's and they're panicked. And then we like address all the chaos in their life. And once we can get that calmed down, um, you know, they're like, oh, whew, that's not it. So that's a good but what is the difference? Uh, well, okay, so then what, what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? So the biggest difference is Alzheimer's is an actual disease, whereas dementia is a collection of symptoms. It's a constellation of symptoms. So it's more of a disorder in disordered function or dysfunction than it is an actual disease. So for instance, Alzheimer's is the leading cause of dementia. But if you have dementia, it doesn't mean that you also have Alzheimer's. They don't have one and the other. Uh, the biggest thing is to remember that dementia is, generally speaking, two combined loss or dysfunction in cognitive spaces like memory, decision making, impulse control, emotional control. If you start to have pairs or triplicates, two, three, four things together that are associated with brain function, especially cognitive executive function, then you start to ask, okay, well, what degree of dementia could this be? And then the side of Alzheimer's is as a disease process, you can actually see not only from functional medicine, blood work, lab work, from different brain scans, that that's actually a disease process that has specific biomarkers and specific genetic, genetic markers that can show up. Uh, so the simplest answer is one is a disease and the other one is a disorder. They sometimes go together, but they don't always travel in a pair. Right. So why are there more women than men? So it's like two thirds of Americans with Alzheimer's are women. Why, why is that? You know, there's a lot of different research about it that's, that's happening right now in terms of answering that question. But generally speaking, when you have something that's so biased towards a gender and especially female gender, one of the biggest things that you want to look at is hormone chemistry. 
Alzheimer's has a lot of vascular components. It has a lot of hormone components. It has a lot of genetic components. It has a lot of inflammation components. So there's a big factor of what's happening in somebody's bloodstream and blood system or their vascular system, especially as it relates to hormones and nutrition. And this is one of the things that we see that women are also much more predisposed to migraines in terms of the number of women that have migraines and the intensity of their migraines compared to males. So oftentimes a lot of the research is looking at the neurochemistry and the biochemistry and the hormone chemistry of what's happening in a female system as compared to a male system. Um, but I'd say the probably the most straightforward piece that's being investigated at the moment is the blood chemistry that happens for a female that's very different than males. So that sort of segues into my next question that I hear a lot in my world that Alzheimer's is often referred to as type 3 diabetes. Mm -hmm. Um, what does sugar dysregulation have to do with this disease? Well, you know, the biggest thing with diabetes type 3 and sugar dysregulation is it's looking at especially not necessarily just consistent levels of elevated cortisol or adrenaline, but it's looking at the ebbs and flows. Like one of the biggest questions that everybody's asking, similar to what's asking, being asked in the autism community, is this a prevalence or a precedence issue? Is it better testing? Is it more, more di better diagnosis or is it actually an increased prevalence? Like there's more things that are actually happening. Well, the reality is, is what we're seeing in the contemporary culture of the world is the last three generations and today is a great example. It's election day right, in the U.S., um, the, especially in the last year with COVID. Not only the last week, the last year, but the last decade and generation, the human experience is under a significantly higher degree of consistent stress on a daily, moment by moment, hour by hour basis than it ever has been. And probably the biggest thing that's being linked to diabetes type 3 and blood sugar changes is that consistent acceleration in heart rate or adrenaline or cortisol that what's called an HVA axis or essentially how often you have your startle response firing up or how often you have your triggered experiences happening. One of the biggest things that's very heavily shown in the research for Alzheimer's is how consistent inflammation is a part of the conversation. And inflammation is so heavily tied to a stress response, kind of like a fever. If your body has an experience with a fever, it's going to increase your body temperature to try and handle that fever. So anytime there's increased inflammation in your body, it could be a fire that's gotten out of control, or it could be your body trying to contain something that's inappropriate that's happening in your system, kind of like an infection. But at the end of the day, the biggest piece with the blood sugar dysregulation is that if we're consistently having these massive ebbs and flows because we're having constant stress and constant lifestyle experiences that are related to inflammation, then our body is going to stay in a heightened state of anticipation or anxiety and it's not going to feel rested and resourced. And then you end up with long-standing, consistent, sustained fatigue. And at that point, like I mentioned, you take any healthy person and you give them dysregulated sleep for three days, they're going to start to have dysfunction. You give somebody dysregulated blood sugar and circadian rhythms and blood sugar regulation for decades, and their brain at some point, like every other organ in the body, is going to start to break down. Yeah, so um, so you, just so for the audience, you're saying that it's just not food that's causing the blood spikes, that mm -hmm. cortisol long, I mean, that's a big one right there, but yeah. yeah. You know, we're talking about not only your nutritional resource, because when we talk about blood sugar, we're not only talking about what you introduce as an external sugar, but we're talking about what happens in your blood chemistry as it relates to not only glucose, but also cortisol, also adrenaline, because these things are heavily involved in things like what's called epinephrine, norepinephrine, adrenaline. So anything that you essentially think of in the brain that is a gas pedal or something that allows you to be activated, that allows you to hit the gas and engage and move forward in the world. The reason it's being called diabetes type 3 or it's connected to this blood sugar kind of component is it doesn't matter how well you eat necessarily if you're having such consistent spikes in your adrenaline and spikes in your anxiety that imagine it this way metaphorically, that you've got a full gas tank. You've eaten really well, you're really well resourced, you've got everything you need, but you're driving in traffic in Atlanta, like I live in downtown in East Atlanta, and you have a full gas tank, but people keep changing lanes into you. 
and you have to slam the gas to change lanes or you have to slam the brakes and then accelerate to not get hit. You're constantly changing this relationship with redlining it and going at a certain speed and then the average speed in Atlanta on the highway is 85. So it doesn't matter how full your gas tank is. If you're staying at a faster RPM or a higher RPM and a faster miles per hour, you're going to run out of fuel faster. So part of it is, yes, we want to have a full gas tank and a good quality fuel in terms of what we're eating because that makes the machine run. But then we also have to have questions, especially when it relates to Alzheimer's and dementia, that part of it is mechanics, part of it is fuel, but a lot of it is how are we driving the vehicle itself from a cognitive engagement standpoint and how we're managing stress and anxiety and depression and panic attacks because part of it is how the car is built, part of it is how the car runs, Part of it is what the fuel is and all the resources in, but the biggest thing when we're talking about cognitive disorders is having a conversation with the driver, and that's your frontal lobe and your executive function. And what do those do <laughs> for the yeah. people who may not know what the frontal lobe and the... Um, <clears throat> sure. The frontal lobe is, is basically your CEO. So the brain is set up a lot like a corporate company or a household. You have leaders or parents or CEOs or executives. You have primary decision makers. And then you have a bunch of employees downstream that work in the background. Think of all of the passengers in a plane. And then you got the stewards and stewardesses that support the pilots. But then you only have so many people actually fly the plane. Well, your frontal lobe is the one that actually flies the plane. Uh, and when you're talking about dementia or Alzheimer's, then the hallmark of those disorders is not looking necessarily at the passengers or the stewards. It's looking at the pilots and saying, how are they navigating the world? And are they making appropriate decisions to get from point A to point B? Are they forgetting their route that they've been taking forever? Are they forgetting how to drive and how to fly the plane that they've got tons of experience with? And are they forgetting how to do some of those things that are second nature to them that now all of a sudden are showing up and somebody's going, you know what, I think that person's not really checked in or they're not cued in and that's a that's an executive decision issue so when we're talking about alzheimer's or dementia we're talking specifically about executive function disorders right so what do you recommend um you know as a therapist i have my ideas of what i do so stress stress is a big driver of this whole thing yeah what do you recommend um to help people to reduce their stress Concrete things. Concrete things, yeah, other than the, the magic bullet, right? Um, you know, realistically, Patty, um, I, I go through what I refer to as the six basics that are, I think, uh, are core foundational daily experiences that everybody has that I tell patients that come in to see me without any hesitation and without any exaggeration that half of the people that I see if they were consistently engaged in really genuinely pursuing six basics, 100% of their current symptoms would resolve because most of the time they're downstream consequences to some of some or all of these six basics getting missed. So I'll give you a couple of these, okay? Uh, it doesn't require any kind of massive amount of funds. It doesn't require seeing 21 specialists like me. It just requires checking in and making sure and what's my current understanding and my current experience with these six things, okay? One which I haven't done a lot since we were talking because I talk fast, is breathe. And when I mean breathe, the thing when you're talking about cognitive function and executive control is are you on autopilot or are you intentionally present and intentionally choosing what you are about to do? Like, have you driven home and forgotten about the drive until you pulled in the driveway and you're like, I don't remember the last 20 minutes of my drive. You weren't present. You're so familiar and so comfortable with the process, you didn't check in. So becoming self-aware and checking in with our own breath and doing breath work and just going, do I know that I'm breathing in through my nose and out through my mouth? Can I breathe in for two and out for four, in for three and out for six? There's so many good breathing exercises. The biggest thing about a breathing exercise is are you present and aware and controlling the effort of each individual breath. Because if you do that, every time you check in and you just go, the CEO just stepped right back into the room and the nature of Alzheimer's, especially when we talk about things like what's called the neurofibrillary tangle, which is kind of like a, a tumbleweed in the brain and all of these other things like inflammation and glial cell activation and all these fancy things that you read about. 
at the end of the day, you want the executive as present as possible, as often as possible to manage those environments rather than them being on vacation and just trusting their employees to do the job, right? Mm-hmm. So intentional breathing is huge. Another thing is hydration. There's some really cool science that shows that if your baseline of water, your regular baseline of water drops by 2%, cognition drops by 12%. So when we're talking about cognition, hydration and cognition are directly dependent and directly connected to each other. So easy way to know how much to drink is take your body weight, divide it by two. That's how many ounces of water you should drink a day. I'm a big guy. I'm 280 pounds. I have to drink a lot of water. (laughs) Right. So it's one of those things that the more water I drink, the more that my body is resourced and the clearer I can think. So breathe, drink. Another one is sleep. There is no better medicine on the planet than sleep. You can take somebody and give them a single powerful good night of sleep and they will feel reborn. Okay. Sleep is huge. There is no better clinician, no better ER, no better triage than a good night of sleep. So I always tell everybody, if you aren't in bed by 10, and you aren't giving yourself a chance to go to bed when the sun goes down, get up when the sun comes up, give it a chance for 30 days. Just be really intentional about protecting your sleep and having good sleep hygiene. There's great apps like Relax Melodies. There's really great apps for things like uh, sleep meditations and sleep relaxations that are great. Try something. But breathe, hydrate, sleep. The other three quickly are eat. And here's the thing, there's so many, we could talk for weeks on food and nutrition and options. Here's categorically what you're looking for. You're looking for an anti-inflammatory diet. That's the biggest thing. And you're looking for an anti-inflammatory diet that you can manage financially and logistically. I don't need you to go onto the Whole30 diet for the sake of CrossFit and the sake of Whole Foods at the expense of your sanity, your relationships, and everything else that you're doing. If you can manage what you eat in a way that allows you to promote or foster or pursue an anti-inflammatory diet, try and try and do that on a more regular basis, even if it's just one more meal a week, five meals a week, that's great. But anti-inflammatory diets, I like the Whole30 because it's not an addition diet, it's a substitution diet, so you just don't put all the extra stuff you would normally eat in your mouth. Uh, if you can pick it or kill it, you can eat it, right? And it includes coffee, which is my love language, um, so you can still do that. Um, So eating an anti-inflammatory diet is huge. Uh, The last two is to rest, and rest is very different than sleep. Sleep is an unintentional autopilot involuntary action. You cannot choose to go to sleep. You can't even choose to go back to sleep. That's the problem of sleep. If you're trying to sleep, you can't sleep. It's letting go of the effort of sleeping. But when you rest, rest is an intentional action where you decrease the amount of inputs, you decrease the amount of stimulus, you slow down while you're still awake, and you just rest. A really great app is Calm. Another one is Headspace. Another one is Insight Timer. All of those are really, really helpful, but rest is very different than sleep. And the last one, which I think will tie in with the rest of the conversation, is the single greatest thing that you can do to turn the brain on, to integrate it, to develop it, and to sustain it long-term is to move. I would look at what's called bluezones.com, Blue zones are really great studies that show what does it take to be 100 years old and healthy. And out of all of the people that they study, huge groups of people that live to be 100, the only core common denominator that was consistent across every population is 15 to 17,000 steps a day, daily movement. Now, not all of us can get 15 to 17,000 steps a day, so start with 1,500 or start with 150. Again, it's kind of like eating the diet. Whatever works for you, try that but there is no single greater impact to overall brain function than our relationship with gravity and our relationship with keeping our head upright over our shoulders this postural piece is what actually develops the frontal lobe and when you're talking about a cognitive disorder or an executive functioning disorder and we know that the way that the frontal lobe or the ceo is developed is based off of our ability to do this then the really simple answer is we wanna keep doing this as often as possible and move in a regular way where we keep having that conversation with gravity and we give ourselves a chance to catch our balance. That's a huge piece. But those six things of breathe, hydrate, sleep, rest, eat, and move 
are really, really helpful. Love it. You know, I was thinking about the, um, the children of the world and their little um, devices, you know, you're, they're not moving. They're not, you know, they're not breathing. They're not hydrating. They're not sleeping. I mean, I, I see a lot of teenagers and they're a mess. You know, and I see yeah. little babies with phones stuck in their face while they're watching a movie and they're six months old. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. Yeah, and you know, this is one of the things where a lot of folks are asking. I mean, you mentioned the stat at the beginning, but six million currently associated with the diagnosis, 14 in the next de decade, possibly 50% of the population by 2050. And you're like, what in the world is happening that could accelerate that kind of degeneration in just two generations? Realistically, the biggest thing that you're looking at is there's a massive change in our relationship with movement. And when we talk about the diabetes type three or, or blood sugar regulation and all these other pieces, when you're looking at a device that's within arm's reach and it causes your eyes to cross or what's called converge, the part of the brain that actually causes the eyes to converge is the same thing that activates when something moves towards you too quickly and you want to withdraw. Because as you see it coming closer, the natural response is to pull back. The problem is that if we're doing this all day and our eyes are crossed, then we're activating the same part of the brain that deals with the stress response. Then when we're scrolling up on our phone, the part of the brain that deals with vertical eye movements is the exact same part of the brain that manages sympathetics, fight or flight responses, stress responses, star responses, emotional, mental, and physical triggers. It's the survival mechanism. So when we're using a phone that's close to our face, bright and scrolling up all the time, all we're doing is pouring gas all over the system that's like adrenaline, adrenaline, cortisol, norepinephrine, gas pedal, startle, fight or flight, survival, all the time. But because we don't think about it like that, we don't notice it, but everybody downstream is getting the signal, should I back up, should I withdraw, should I be on edge, should I be conscious, should I be scared or anticipation? Then you put the phone down and you're in bed at 11.30 at night, at night after spending 25, 30 minutes on TikTok and an hour and 15 minutes on Facebook, and you go, why am I so wound? Why is it so hard to sleep? Why is my brain racing? Because your brain just spent the last hour with the brightness of your screen thinking the sun was still up, and with the activation of your eye movements, thinking that something was about to go wrong because it's activating your startle responses. So being able to step back from a device, even at minimum, some of the things like I work with 60% of the people that I work with are, are pediatric and nonverbal autism and pediatric head injury. Sometimes the only way that the parents can even get the kids to show up is with a device. So some of the things that I tell people is if you can't, if you can't get, if you can't change your relationship with the quantity or the frequency of use, change your relationship with its location. So move it from being here where you're bent down and your posture is all changed to sitting upright and making it eye level so it looks like you're taking a photo of somebody. Change it from being right here in your face where you can even see how it's lighting up my glasses on my face to just saying, I'm gonna use it with my elbows straight. Because here's the thing, if I keep my phone at shoulder level and eye level and I keep my elbow straight, you know what's gonna happen in about three minutes? My arm's gonna fatigue. And then I have to make the executive decision to go, is it worth continuing to use this if I'm going to be here or am I willing to make that agreement with myself that if I can't keep it up and I can't keep it out, I'll put it down. So you not only exercise a less provocative position, but when you decide to put it down, you're exercising that executive part of your brain to step back and say, I'm going to choose how I engage with this technology. And all of that is really healthy brain exercise, especially for Alzheimer's. You want to do cognitive exercises. And if you struggle to put your device down, it's going to be very helpful to exercise the capacity of that decision maker by making a decision that's hard. Because here's one of the phrases I use for patients all the time. If it's hard, it's helpful. If it's harmful, it's not. So if you make a decision and it's hard, but it's not going to hurt you, you need to make those on a regular basis so your brain knows what it feels like to make hard decisions. Because when you get into a space of going, I can't remember where I am. I can't remember how to get home. That kind of hard decision is going to be much more disorienting than in your mid-30s consistently saying, I'm just going to put the phone down for 30 minutes. It's a helpful thing for sure. So I wanted to talk to you also, Dr. Jerome, about the APOE um, yes. gene. Yes, uh, because that has been identified as uh, a marker for some people. 
for uh, Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So like, what is the APO gene and um, what if I have it? Sure. So we have the, the, the world of, of, of genetics and gene uh, therapy and, and all the other sides is fascinating and huge. Basically, what it means is this is a particular biomarker, a particular genetic marker in your genetics, the way that your DNA is made. DNA is kind of like a zipper. It connects and stitches, and if it doesn't connect just right, you can have a little abnormality. There's also things called alleles. It's basically a way that a gene is made, constructed. Think of it like scaffolding that makes a building. If something doesn't sync up just right, does it end up changing the structure and the integrity of the system? It can. So without the fancy genetic side of the conversation, the biggest thing to remember right now with the current research in Alzheimer's especially is that there is a correlation with APOE, not a causation, not a confirmed causation. So what that means is they haven't said that if you have APOE, even if you have APOE4, because they said that 2 has a consistent component of saying maybe it's preventative and it helps to disrupt it helps to prevent or assist in terms of the, the progression of Alzheimer's. Three kind of has a neutral engagement. Four might be correlated more often with being a predisposition to it. So what I say that is right now, the biggest thing that happens, and again, we're talking about a disorder that's very heavily tied to inflammation, to stress, and to anxiety. And then somebody gets their genetic test, they have an APOE4, and all of a sudden now their anxiety goes through the roof and they're like, this is a confirmation. This is a diagnosis. It is not. I want to say that really clearly. It isn't. It's a correlation, not a causation. And it means you might be predisposed to it. But especially if you get that when you are well before the, even the early signs of it, and you go, okay, this lets me know that just like if I had more predisposition to stroke, more predisposition to high blood pressure or cholesterol, which those factors are also connected with Alzheimer's, if I knew going into my lifestyle regimen that I'm predisposed to Alzheimer's, where I have a higher percentage chance of that, what would I do differently? I want really more than anything for people to realize when you see a genetic marker that has a connection or a correlation, especially before the diagnosis is presented, that is an opportunity for you to course correct. It doesn't mean that that's a destination. It means it's a more likely destination because you live on a continent that has that in its space. If I live in Africa and Alzheimer's doesn't live on the continent of Africa, but I'm traveling to the U.S. and the U.S. happens to have Alzheimer's all over the place, I'm more likely to land this place, a space with Alzheimer's. But that doesn't mean that I can't change the way that I'm naturally navigating and oriented towards those spaces. So does it mean that you can make the best decisions possible and you might still end up with it? Yeah. You know, you're talking to somebody who's averaged 100 migraines per calendar year for the last 20 years, despite doing really, really, really good work to avoid it. And I have an identical twin brother that does not have this. So you can have the best laid plans, and sometimes it still doesn't work. And that's okay. That's where support comes in and community comes in, and really good quality management of a diagnosis that you have comes in. But more than anything with this gene component, I would just really encourage everybody, when you see anything like that in your in your own genetic testing or your own genetic results, it does not mean that you have the disease. It means that you have some information that makes you more informed about better decisions that you can do to help you diminish and mitigate the likelihood of having that show up at all, if not avoid having it show up faster. Right. Our genes aren't our destiny. Yeah, absolutely. Epi epigenetics proves that. Neuroplasticity proves that. So. Right. And I think, you know, doing those six basic things you mentioned are like key. You know, if we do that, we would have a lot less disease. Yeah. You know, it's, it's amazing. I mean, you just look at the research of what happens. Uh, just Google in, in Google Scholar or on any of the major search engines for, for research data and just Google meditation and epigenetics and see what happens when they do really good quality studies with people who just slow down, rest and breathe and how it actually literally changes gene transcription. So if we know that there's studies that have proven that you can change your genetic expression, which is a hardware, you're not talking about a software issue, you're talking a hardware issue. If you can do a software change by changing the way you interact with the world and it's strong enough to make a hardware change like genetics, 
then we know that there's ways to go. Okay, like for instance, one of the most interesting, re, uh, one of the most interesting uh, interventions or kind of avenues that people are pursuing with Alzheimer's is controlled and um, controlled and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's when some, I just lost it. Forgive me. Uh, it's supervised fasting. So controlled and supervised fasting. If you do controlled and supervised fasting and you give your brain a chance to take a break from eating so much food and it shifts from de from from breaking down food to doing garbage disposal and debris cleanup and spring cleaning in the brain, it's one of the most fascinating things that they've shown for increased clarity regardless of where you are cognitively. So I say that to say when you're doing things like meditating and slowing down and breathing and, and decreasing your caloric intake in a controlled way and, and doing intermittent fasting, all of those things are saying, how do I give my brain and my body an effective break so it can catch its breath, literally and figuratively, right? So it's super helpful. So, um, you know, obviously when symptoms are noticeable, it gets people's attention, but when when are the brain, for Alzheimer's dementia, like when does the brain actually start to change or be damaged? I know I asked my dad that. My dad, my mom is 91, mm -hmm. and he said 50 years ago. Yeah. And that like things start out. Well, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think it's one of those things that it's such a it's such a hard thing to pin down in terms of an event, right? Like we think of brain injury, and I work with folks like an eight year old that's been run over by a dump truck on foot, right? You have that moment where you say, okay, this was that mechanism of injury. This was the event that changed everything. Right, but when you're talking about cognitive disorders or frontal lobe dementia or Alzheimer's, you know you're looking at an arc. You're looking at a continuum and a spectrum of years. This is not Alzheimer's and dementia. By definition, are not singular event uh, diagnoses. They're not. They're not one moment that caused it. It's a constellation of life experiences. Right. Um, so I'd say probably the the hallmark of when people start to get concerned is when you see really significant abnormal behavior. It's when somebody all of a sudden completely loses their their context. They get this. Think of it in context of disorientation. I don't know what my thoughts are, and I'm aware of it. I don't know who you are, and you're aware of that. I don't know what's happening with my emotions. I don't know where I am in space. I'm losing my balance. If you start to have really, really intense moments of disorientation or really, really significant mood swings, this is where I keep coming back to kind of asking that space of how intense is it? How frequent is it? What's the duration? How strong was that experience? How often did it happen? How long did it last? Especially when you're talking about things that are so heavily related to stress and lifestyle. If your dad went back 50 years ago with your mom and said, yeah, your mom had those moments where she kind of, she lost touch for a second or she got confused or she got disoriented or she wasn't really in the right state of mind. Because you got to remember Latin for dement or demented is out of mind or out of your mind. So when you're looking at it and saying, yeah, I lost context with, with what was happening. Well, was that something that was happening on a monthly basis, on a yearly basis, rarely? It's when you start to notice, especially I would say a really safe way of looking at this, is if based on your personal experience and based on the relationships of the people that you do life with, that it feels like the consistency has picked up. It feels like those moments are lasting for longer and it feels like they're more intense when they happen, especially when those three things start to come in tandem with each other, then you wanna start being curious before you start being concerned. And why I say that is if you allow yourself to start asking clarifying questions and to start considering, is those, are those experiences happening because you're fatigued? Is it happening because you had a significant trauma? Is it happening because you've been under a significant amount of stress and work? Is it happening because you haven't taken a vacation in four years? And then seeing what does it look like for me to rest well, to sleep well, to hydrate and to move and to breathe? And do I see those things go away? It may be that those experiences that we're having when we get those warning signs are actually really appropriate and understandable responses from the body trying to give us a signal that you're fatigued. Mm -hmm. Listen to them. And we give ourselves a chance to connect with folks like you and do good quality counseling, do good quality nutrition, do good quality neurofeedback, and see if those things resolve. 
then it's just like anything else that we would have if we had a cold and we started to get that hiccup or that sneeze or that cough, we wouldn't automatically throw a red flag that it's cancer. So when we have these concerns about some of these things, if it starts to become really consistent, especially if the intensity, frequency, and duration increase and you're attempting to minimize that, you're attempting to make an impact, but you're not getting traction, when you know you're actively working against it, but you're not gaining traction, it's a really important time to start getting some consultation from some specialists and some experts and go, is this what I'm seeing? Is this something I should be concerned about? And what exactly is the feedback? Because the, the interesting thing with Alzheimer's really more so than even dementia is you can see really significant and really particular things show up on lab work and advanced imaging that can help you go, are we starting to see the signs and symptoms of structural change in the brain and biophysiological or neurochemistry changes or neuro neurophysiological changes in the body through lab work? If you start to see things that show up on cholesterol and blood pressure and cortisol and adrenal tests that are saying this is not within normal or healthy ranges, that's really helpful information to go, okay, well, what's the way that we could course correct? So um, I just want to also ask you, so if, you, if you're if you in your 20s or 30s, I'm switching gears here because we've got to kind of wind up a little bit, but so if you're sure. in your 20s or 30s, are there things that we should be doing, I'm um, past the, in case you didn't know, or, you know, in our 40s or 50s, like, what should we be doing, you know, because I think the youth is indestructible and they don't think it's going to happen to them. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, uh, I think the short answer, Patty, and, and this is more connected to the work you do as, a, uh, as a, an LPC, a professional counselor, is I don't think there's any single, for any age, but especially in the 20s and 30s, because it isn't an age that has required it as of yet, but if you can proactively do it long-term, it's the greatest investment on the planet, is I don't think there's any single greater step that you can make to improve your own personal health than increase self-awareness. Most people just don't know what makes them tick. They don't know what their triggers are. They don't know what their purpose is. They don't know what makes them feel safe, what makes them feel, feel fearful. So that opportunity to connect with somebody who can help you increase your self-awareness, not only in mind, body, and soul, right? Am I aware of where my body is? Like, do I know what it means to have a body-based practice like breath work or yoga or qigong or CrossFit or whatever allows me to connect with my body? I might be moving so fast, I got to learn how to slow down. I might be moving so slow, I got to learn how to engage, right? What's my relationship with physical activity? And then with mental and emotional real estate, do I know, do I have a baseline of what my emotional intelligence is? Do I have a baseline on what it is that I'm doing in terms of my relationship with anxiety or the lack thereof? Because some people have absolutely zero anxiety and it's because they haven't checked in with what is a relevant concern that they should be concerned about, right? Or people have excess anxiety and they don't know how to cope in a way that makes them feel like they're managing their anxiety. So when you're talking about mental, emotional, physical, relational, or spiritual health, which I think all five of them are a factor, just asking what is my awareness with my current level of health in the physical, mental, emotional, relational, and spiritual spaces. You can do one or all five or a combination thereof, but if somebody had really intentionally moved any of us in our 20s into an, into an active practice of self-awareness and self-discovery, that would bias and influence literally everything that we do downstream. Right. That's that's great. You know, um, in my newsletter that I wrote, it was all, it was about that being self-aware and you know, like what are our triggers? Why? Why do I react that way? And my answer to some of that was start journaling. Yeah. You know, write it down and be curious without being judgmental, mm -hmm. which, um, you know, I think that's just a healthy thing. And uh, I love yeah. when my clients do those things. <laughs> Yeah, and it's huge. And to your point with that and the other half of the question, this is something that's really helpful for folks who are 40 and older, or they're getting into their 40s and older, is in that sort of space, it's the shift of being the indestructible kind of production-oriented or engagement, like pursuit side of the brain of, I just want to I just want to consume life, right? Um, when you start getting into 40 and older, you're going to have a law of diminishing returns, okay? It's the basics of economics. You can't go at the same speed or go at the same hour or go at the same rate. So one of the biggest things conceptually as we start to get 40 and older is you may not be able to change your threshold, but you can increase your margin. 
which means that if you start to realize, okay, this is where I tap out and it's way lower than it was when I was 20, that's okay. Instead of trying to pursue a change in threshold, figure out what is changing your margin. Where are you depleting resources that you don't need to? If you do an inventory and do an audit on where you're investing your energy in all of those five spaces that I just mentioned, and you change it like you did a bu like you would a financial budget, and you step back and you do that audit and you go, man, I'm pouring a ton of time and energy into this particular space, and I don't feel like I'm getting a great return on that. Maybe you make the decision to reallocate those resources to either savings and just step back, or you put them into something that feels like it's more life-giving. But the simple concept that I would say is just to look at what does it feel like to have more margin. If you don't feel rested at age 40 and older, that is probably the single greatest concern, 40 and up. You don't have to necessarily find consistent rest when you're 20 or when you're 30. But when you get 40 and older, if you don't have an intimate, personal, and consistent relationship with rest, you are going to run out of fuel, and it's going to be very consequential at that age, especially as you start to add a year or add a decade. So increasing margin and increasing intentional rest and making sure that you're engaging in things that are life-giving is a really, really good way to budget your personal resources as an individual as you get older. Because it's not about self it's it's about self-awareness but it's about self-awareness in relationship with rest as well, which is, it is even more important. And movement, I'd say movement is still, for me, at the top of the food chain. So I have two questions, and, and these are personal questions that I, one was I was always curious, like why do some people with Alzheimer's have good days and other days where they're flat and non-responsive? Yeah. And then the other part of that question is, um, if a person's non-communicative, how do you know our, and this is, this is what my family's dealing with now. My mom is not eating. She's losing weight. Mm -hmm. is, is her brain shutting down? Is her body shutting down? Or is it maybe just the health, the caregivers can't give her enough time to feed her? Gosh, yeah, what great questions. Um, and also the, the difficulty of those spaces, right? Um, to answer the first question, you know, the, the reality with cognitive disorders or frontal, frontal lobe dementias or Alzheimer's executive function disorders is metaphorically, it's, it's watching somebody go back full circle to the start of how they turned on in the first place. Every single thing that you see happening in somebody with Alzheimer's is age appropriate in somebody who is zero to three months old or zero to six months old, zero to 12 months old. It's really normal. But when you see somebody in their 90s who doesn't think to eat, or doesn't have any emotional response or is very flat, you're seeing that regression into a lack of activity in the brain that was normal in the 60, 70, 80 year mark, right? Um, so part of that is that it is the brain starting to lose connection, but really more than anything with Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's is a very heavy component of what's called placking, kind of like placking in an artery or placking on your teeth. The challenge is the placking happens between the synapse that actually connects and makes the brain have that connection. So I want you to think more like uh, most people who are over 30 will be more familiar with this. <laughs> Some people under 30 aren't, but a spark plug has that gap that when it fires off and it connects, then the engine starts up, right? But you can know with a car that runs off of spark plugs, you can feel it sputter. And if there's a ton of gunk on that spark plug and it can't make its way through and it won't make that connection, the engine won't turn on or turn over and you just don't get it started. It's just dead or it's non-active. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. so when you're talking these questions, you're talking very much about activation, similar to a spark plug. So sometimes you can have it happen where you go outside with that old car, you fire it up and boom, it starts straight away. And then you can go outside and you can try every single trick you know in the book and it just won't turn over. That's because the part of the brain that's happening in Alzheimer's is very similar to the spark plugs. If for some reason it just can't make that connection electrically and it won't fire off and it won't start up, it's just sometimes, is it too cold? Is it that the car has been, you know, is, has been sitting for too long and it's got dust or it's got buildup? Has it been that the oil hasn't been changed? Metaphorically, what I mean by that is, what is somebody's physical activation? If you're asking somebody to engage cognitively, they're going to have to engage their body first. Because the way the brain turns on in an infant is you don't see any child learn to speak 
or develop any kind of rapport or eye contact or executive decision making, even the capacity to form one single full sentence until they've learned to stand, walk, and often run, right? Movement integrates the brain and turns it on. So if we're asking for somebody to be active cognitively, but they're not active physically, that's really, really hard to do. That's like asking a car to consistently turn on, but it's never being moved, it's being garaged. It's just going to be harder. So then the question becomes, how do I do physical activity with somebody in their 90s that isn't engaging? Sometimes it's kind of like we do with, a, I've got a four week, a five week old right now. If I left my five week old in the bassinet unattended to, and I didn't move him, his experience with brain activation would be very different than if I pick him up and I move him around the room or I rock him, right? So I, I don't say this to create a patronizing response to somebody who's in their 90s. I'm saying metaphorically, what can I do to physically activate the body of somebody who has decreased decrease affect, decreased facial tone, decreased communication? Is it passive movements of their limbs? Is it something where I'm putting them in a chair where I can actually rock their body and change their relationship with gravity? It's just a question of saying, is that person able to stand? And if they're able to stand, even if they're not able to speak, can I physically encourage them to stand and then take them for a walk? You know, there's a lot of different things that we're looking at, um, but more than anything, when you're talking about Alzheimer's, especially as it gets into older spaces in terms of age, you're really more than anything looking at the breakdown of the mechanical connection of those spark plugs firing off in the synapses, and and that can that can be a real thing, absolutely. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Graham. That that helps, and um, you know, I hope my sisters and my dad are listening to this. <laughs> yeah, you want me to answer that last question about? Hospice quick, I'm sorry, I'm, I know we're running You out. did, you did, because it's the, it's the breakdown of the spark plugs and the brain's not saying, sure. I mean, that's sort of what I gleaned from that. Yeah, absolutely. And this is, you know, to that last point, knowing when to transition somebody, which is a really hard question, um, is if you don't feel like you have the resources, the time or the equipping to do those things, to activate somebody's system and to keep them, even if it's not a verbal communication, it's some sort of activation in the body. If you're getting decreased responses from your family member, you can't get them to eat, you can't get them to move, and you don't have the capacity or the resources, the skill or the training to now take it into the arena of forcing that. Because I can't look at my five week old and say, well, he doesn't feel like eating, so I'll just leave him alone. I have to resource him with nutrition. So if we're trying to make sure that that person who's really in those late stages or is struggling with those spaces is not being able to engage in a way that helps them to eat, to hydrate, to move, then it might be a, a time to look at either support that comes into the house or folks that are trained to do that uh, in ways that will make sure that that person is able to eat and to move and to hydrate. So really important. Thank you. So as we're wrapping up, do you have any last thoughts for the audience? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that I would, I would encourage everybody uh, is the Alzheimer's uh, organization, ALZ.org, actually has a really cool to tutorial and kind of like, it's a free workshop and like learning about Alzheimer's. Um, a lot of the times this information can feel so overwhelming and so inundating that I think a lot of the times it's coming back to, have we checked in with those six basics? Do I have some clarification on, on what it is that we're dealing with? There are the resources on ALZ.org or other sites, Facebook pages like this. Uh, and just remembering that with neuroplasticity and epigenetics, your brain has a profound capacity to change. Um, I would really look up the work of Oliver Sacks uh, and look up the work of folks like um, Norman Deutsch, which is D-O-I-D-G-E. He has a Netflix special and also two books called the brain that changes itself and the brain that the brain's way of healing, Norman D O I D G E, giving yourself the exposure to information that doesn't simply relegate these diagnoses to a black hole of indefinite kind of uh, dysfunction. I think what we need more than anything in these spaces as patients, as family members, as caregivers, as human beings is, is a little bit of hope and encouragement. Um, and those resources can really help you see that there are people that are doing really, really good work uh, with being able to, to activate the brain despite what everybody says. Uh, I think we're more capable of change than we think we are. We just sometimes don't know how to do it, you know? Yeah, yeah. So um, 
Do you want to just say a word about your other, you have your Thrive, Thrive Neuro Health, but you're also doing Thrive Neuro Theology and Identity? Do you want to just? Sure. Yeah, happy to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And Patty knows I'm allergic to self-promotion, so <laughs> go ahead and do it. Um, no, so the clinic is where I take care of, I, I specialize in complex unresolved cases like what we talked about tonight. Um, but two other spaces that I work in, one is called Thrive Neurotheology, which is the intersection between neuroscience and spirituality. Uh, a great guy who uh, you can go and look up is Andrew Newberg. He has about nine books on this. He created the field of neurotheology. Uh, he's got some great practical books on meditation and all these other spaces. Um, but the work that I do is creating practical application at those two intersections to try and help with self-care at the same time as engaging uh, with our, our spiritual work. Um, whole identity is a model that I worked on through uh, a personality typology and identification process called the Enneagram. Uh, up until last year, there was no book on the brain-based model or anything that was based in neuroscience. Um, I've been working for the last 10 years to kind of create a model on that. Uh, and whole identity is a brain-based model of the Enneagram that helps us to understand how we function and how we engage in the world from a personality and a motivation standpoint. Uh, but also connecting the dots with brain function, connecting the dots with practical application, and trying to use a different avenue of being healthy. So I can be a clinician, I can be you know, a, a neurotheologian, so to speak, and then also uh, do brain coaching through Enneagram language and, uh, and lifestyle choices and changes. So. Very, very cool stuff. Yeah. Yes, Congratulations on that. That's a lot of work. <laughs> Thank you. It's uh, practicing what I preach. And, uh, and, and doing it over the course of years rather than months, even though my heart desires to do it faster, um, knowing that my pace has to be really important and that's okay too. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you again and thank you to the audience for um, listening in and I hope it was a helpful um, show for you. If you have any questions, you can either um, contact me through Holistic Healing Atlanta or you can uh, contact Dr. Libic through his, um, drjerome.com. So good night, everybody. Cheers. Thank you. Hi, I'm Patty Dorito of Holistic Healing Atlanta. And uh, one of the things I do is holistic methylation. So we're balancing out genetics. And so what that is, when, when a gene isn't working, sometimes we have to have a supplement to help get that gene to work properly. But have you ever had a supplement that your friend told you is like life-changing, but for you didn't do anything? Well, there's a reason for it because your body doesn't need it. So I'm gonna give you a little demonstration of two supplements that are pretty popular that people often come in and say, will this be beneficial to me? Now I'm not balancing out his, his genes here, but so one of them is CoQ10. So a lot of people hear about that. And so I'll just put that in his hand and then I'm going to take this hand and say, is this safe? And it's not even safe for him. So I put that back in here. And then here's another one. And this is, again, this is specific to Paul. Um, it's zinc. Now, of course, with COVID, everybody thinks I need zinc, but this isn't necessarily true. So I'm putting some zinc in his hand. And then I'm going to check, is this safe? And is it beneficial? Absolutely, yes. So for Paul, this is something that would probably work if we were balancing out his genetics. So that's how I tell if something's going to be beneficial, safe and beneficial. Thank you.